right, folks, I'll get started here. Uh, thanks for coming uh, to Exhibit Hall C here. Um, here's our topic. I'll spend a few minutes um, giving you a bit of the uh, abstract and uh, how I'm going to lay out the discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll just take it from there. Here's how we're flowing through it. I'm going to give you an overview. I'm going to give you some context on who I am, what I do. I'm going to define for you what I mean by diverse feedback when I'm uh, using that phrase. Uh, I'm going to describe to you why Jenkins is important to our workflow, um, and essentially uh, describe to you why we went, we went in this direction, which also includes describing kind of the uh, difficulties or challenges we saw with what I'm calling monochromic uh, feedback. I'm going to jump into the kinds of problems we were able to solve um, with this uh, new approach. Essentially what this is is a discussion. A, uh, uh, we questioned the CI model and how we used the CI model, uh, my company, on uh, how uh, we basically get the value out of uh, uh, a build's sort of return of pass or fail. Uh, once we sort of questioned that model and um, pushed back against it and revisited it, uh, we were able to um, speed up development. Um, we, if we take this shift left kind of uh, concept uh, we've been hearing this weekend, um, part of that also means empowering the engineers uh, with more information uh, so they can make uh, informed decisions. Uh, and it also helped us just in terms of our infrastructure. A little bit about me. I work at edX, I'll describe that in a moment. I'm working on a few different teams, tools, performance, accessibility, and escalation. Uh, the focus on all of these teams is also enabling development. Um, for example, with the performance team, uh, we certainly uh, look to optimize our infrastructure, but we also look to provide tools to engineers to understand the impacts of their changes. Same with accessibility. Um, escalation team is sort of a second level support team. Their job is to reduce interruptions to engineers. Um, I also want to give you just a little context on my background. I do do some coding. Probably the best description of it is uh, my GitHub profile. You can see it's tailed off last couple months. Um, but I still get in there and commit stuff. Um, here are the different areas uh, in terms of my Jenkins experience that I've worked in. Um, Groovy, of course, is very familiar for a lot of us here. Um, I've used it on various infrastructures, including AWS, um, Python Django applications, Hadoop applications built with Gradle. Um, I've been working on Jenkins since 2012. Uh, I've helped out with some uh, plugins and so on. Um, <laughs> sorry, I really want to be comfortable with you guys. I'm from Texas originally. I went to school in Minnesota. I've been in Boston the last 17 years. And uh, personally, I hope to learn how to skateboard one day. Happy to talk about any of that stuff with you, especially any skateboarding experts out there. Um, I wanted to print for you the mission statement of my company, edX. Um, I'm just going to give you a second to read it. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is get education accessible all over the globe um, through uh, our application and of course the infrastructure that runs that application. Uh, we think it's important, uh, it's critical to um, you know, us as a, as a society. Um, edX is a nonprofit organization. We are part of MIT and Harvard, or rather we are founded by MIT and Harvard, part of MIT currently. And we are a MOOC provider. Um, if you haven't heard that uh, acronym, uh, that's a massive open online course. Um, tens of thousands of learners registering for a course, uh, potentially getting college credit, uh, potentially getting uh, credentials, verified search certifications, and so on. Uh, in terms of our actual application, we have uh, over 8 million learners at this point. The real key for, uh, for me here uh, in this context is that we're open source. So uh, the edX org website is powered by our open source application, uh, the edX platform. Um, uh, edX platform is one of many different applications uh, that are hosted on GitHub uh, under the edX org, um, and many of them are running Python Django. Using uh, our open source software, we have uh, 
you know, approximately, there are approximately 300 uh, sites powered by, uh, by our code, uh, giving you millions more learners uh, who, are, who are using it. Which again, wraps into the mission, right? We're not gonna try to educate everyone, instead we're gonna try to create the facilities such that folks can educate themselves. Um, so that's all the context. Um, Jenkins comes in, uh, it's obviously critical for us to be able to inspect our code. And this is essentially the workflow, which should look very familiar to a lot of folks in the room. In our case, we have engineers at edX, we also have open source contributors. Um, our code is managed on GitHub or is stored on GitHub. Uh, so our integration uh, with Jenkins and GitHub is really important to the development cycle. And of course, from there, once we've got um, code we feel good about, it's uh, pushed out to all these different sites affecting all these uh, learners. Um, I do wanna have a couple sidebars here and there uh, throughout this talk just to give you a sense of um, our infrastructure. So um, in terms of our uh, Jenkins instance, we can expand up to 200 nodes, uh, run over 200,000 tests per hour. I realize we've got much larger implementations here, but I want you to have an understanding of what, uh, what I'm working with. Okay, so now the topic at hand. What, what am I talking about when I say diverse feedback? Uh, I like to use the uh, analogy of a pair. So if we have a question on whether or not we want to eat a pear, um, generally, at least for me, um, I might pick it out of a basket and inspect it a number of different ways. I'll hold it, I'll feel how firm it is, um, I'll look for any bruises. Uh, when we talk about a CI system, we're really just looking to photograph in black and white. And maybe not even that, maybe even that's more information than what we're, uh, we're generally given. I think it's much better to have a bit more pieces of information. So I gave an example of that with various yes or no questions, right? For example, if it looks great but it was picked out of the trash, that might be useful information to know, right? Is it firm or squishy, um, and so on. If we were to take that same question of whether or not we decided, if, whether or not we want to use or eat that pear, having a, a few more contexts can actually be very helpful. Um, I want to sort of further illustrate this with the CI system itself. I'm calling it monochromic feedback. We could also consider it binary feedback. And that's my first argument, right? The narrowest implementation of a system is just running tests on it. And in my case, it's Python, right? Uh, in other, um, other code bases, it might be just the compilation, might be just the build of, of the product. But this is essentially is the starting point. When you, when you get uh, the response from the build, it's a pass or fail. I see this as one bit. You have one bit of information to decide what to do with the, the changes. It's a zero or one. Now, caveat, of course, I understand. You can dig in. It's true. Uh, in this case, using the JUnit plugin, we can understand that there are actually a number of tests that um, determine whether or not it's a zero or one return, right? But for the most part, for a developer, for an engineer, they're looking for the green check mark or the red X. That's the piece of information that they're using to decide what to do next. And that includes reviewers. If a reviewer is tagged on a pull request on GitHub, that's the first thing they're gonna look at. Is this even worth my time right now? Should I proceed? So what we found is that our engineers were spending cycles looking at the red X in various ways. I'm giving you three examples of kind of the outcome of that investigation. First, sometimes the failure was just not important or wasn't relevant. Um, I'll describe that momentarily. Sometimes the failure was a flaky test. It was unrelated to the changes. And sometimes it was totally worth it. There was actually a problem that the CI system found that needs to be addressed uh, immediately. So here, it took time to investigate. Maybe we looked into it and ultimately determined that ultimately determined that we could continue with code review. Is that me? Um, in terms of a flaky test, we took time, we determined it was flaky, we realized it was unrelated. And of course, worth it in that case. 
So I first want to look at this one. Um, what I mean by this, for example, are static code analysis, linters. Those are things that are valuable, they are useful, they might not be important right now. These might be parts of code that are going to be changed in the next commit, but if you're a code reviewer, you might not worry about linting just yet, because we already have a tool that does that for you. Um, and it might be okay to proceed. If you saw a failure and you knew it was linting, for example, uh, you might be okay to just proceed and give the engineer feedback on the changes they've made. Flaky tests, um, I'm sure uh, all of us have dealt with those. Uh, in our case, uh, and in many cases, flaky tests can be related to things that are not related to the code change, right? Um, Front-end testing is uh, asynchronous in nature. Um, we have, uh, I've seen tests with random seeds fail randomly, <laughs> and um, tests that rely on third-party software rely on the network. Again, these are things that are sort of beyond the control or uh, due to uh, poor code. Um, that's unrelated to the changes. So similar thing, these need to be fixed. I'm not saying they don't need to be fixed. Um, in the case of providing feedback on a code review, the fixes generally won't be on this actual pull request. So it's creating some noise, uh, it's creating some lag. So one thing uh, that we did as we were sort of looking at this model, questioning the, um, the you know, one bit sort of approach uh, is what's the actual behavior of engineers? Because we want to cater to that, uh, to the behaviors, uh, at least a little bit, right? In our case, um, that included looking at ourselves and what we did with our changes. And what we found, um, particularly with flaky tests that are, might be unrelated, for example, um, switching that from a, a, um, a defect and looking just at the behavior, folks reran everything whether that was a new commit or interacting with the Jenkins system to ask for a new build, they reran it. In this case, if we had everything bundled up into one build, that could be costly. That could take some time. And even if we had the best intentions, intentions we found that even ourselves, we would just, just hit rerun. It's less interruptive, you can get back to work um, if you just ask it to rerun and check in later and see if you get a green check mark next time. So for the tools team, uh, this sort of uh, monochromic uh, approach, it took cognitive load to actually take sort of some of the flakiness and some of the, um, uh, the various results that you get on, from these builds. Uh, it took time to understand which ones were important, which ones we really had to deal with. Uh, similar for engineers, uh, it made it difficult to prioritize. Uh, to a certain extent, um, if the system becomes unstable enough, it feels a little bit like, uh, like a roulette game, right? Where um, you're just, you're, you're spinning the wheel and you're trying to get the right, uh, the right return as opposed to actually paying attention to the quality of your code. So uh, we switched gears uh, once we took time to reflect on this and think about how we're interacting with the system um, using GitHub, for example, for code reviews and looking at the green check mark of the red X. We split up our builds into six different contexts. So this produced six jobs um, that would be spawned from one pull request. Python unit tests, obviously critical piece. JavaScript unit tests, which are part of our platform, uh, run by uh, Jasmine with Karma as the runner. We actually have two contexts for our acceptance tests Lettuce and bok choy. So um, folks that might not be too familiar with the Python side of things, lettuce is uh, very similar to cucumber. It's sort of like a Python port. Bok choy uh, uses the page object model. Um, but either way, we're talking about Selenium context here. Uh, we have a build that we call quality. That's the static code analysis. So I mentioned linters earlier, but I don't want to overemphasize that. Uh, static, um, for example, the PyLint tool, um, can actually find vulnerabilities in your code, can find bugs in your code. Um, it's not just styling. Um, but it's static code analysis, so that in itself is uh, its own context. There's also the accessibility context. So I'm gonna take a, a, a brief sidebar to describe to you what that means. I'm gonna flash for you a definition from the um, Web Accessibility Initiative, 
which is a part of W3C. I'll let you read that for a minute. So if you'll just indulge me for a minute to help explain this. Um, when I use the web, when I use, um, when I'm on a website and I interact with it, I use my fingers on the keyboard, I use my mouse, um, I read it with my eyes, I might get feedback uh, uh, by listening. Um, if a website is designed, um, in my case, I might be in great shape. Um, making a website accessible means that folks that might not necessarily use the same things I'm using um, can still interact with and absorb the content of a uh, website. So for example, screen readers uh, might help someone who's not able to really re read the screen him or herself without an assistive device, for example. Um, I left in that second line because that's important as well. Uh, to a certain extent, um, um, to me it reflects a little bit of response to design. Uh, if you're designing your website to be accessible, um, you're also allowing folks that decide to perceive it in different ways to be able to interact with it successfully. So I just want to give you that sidebar. So this is another um, context that we use. Uh, th we have some automation that detects uh, accessibility issues. Um, so how do we implement this? How do we um, actually give feedback in these different contexts? We're using the GitHub pull request builder plugin. So I'm gonna go through a couple of the screens there and I'm gonna go through some of the features. Uh, it's a feature-rich plugin. I'm not gonna cover everything. I, if you're curious about it, I encourage you to take a look uh, on uh, JenkinsCI.org. So the first piece is we're using the, um, uh, the uh, webhook model on Git, on GitHub rather. So when GitHub detects a commit or a new pull request, that will reach out to our Jenkins instance, which is listening, uh, to understand what the change is and whether or not a job needs to be spun off. So in this particular case, um, someone put in a new commit. And you can see without even leaving the GitHub UI, uh, what's going on. Uh, a build is running. You can dig into a particular pull request and you can get even more information. So in this case, we already are starting to feel good about this particular set of changes. Uh, we're waiting on the longest running build, which is the Python unit test. So in this example, if someone made a JavaScript change, you're gonna feel good about continuing to do review, for example. Here's the negative case. Here's an example where there were some failures. Still valuable information for both the developer and the reviewers to understand where the failures are and potentially make a decision on how to continue. If these contexts are stable or if they're relevant to the changes, you might not even, as a reviewer, you might not even want to, to start reviewing. You want, might wanna wait for that to get fixed. And I just, I also wanted to show you this picture. If everything passes, it's just a green check mark. Very helpful. Uh, for those of you that are counting at home, you'll see there's seven here, and I promised there were six. We have a seven in the context that measures your, uh, your coverage. Um, the interaction point continues to be the GitHub UI as you're working on this pull request. And we essentially did it by um, using this plugin. Um, uh, calling it a DSL would be aggressive, but we have some light um, uh, language that all developers understand and can use to help rerun certain things. So in this example, a developer came onto GitHub and they decided to rerun the acceptance tests. Um, perhaps they detected a flaky, a flaky test. It only runs those. Everything else that is already run and passed and used the infrastructure and taken time stays. Those are already passed, we're good to go. There's also a global configuration where you can decide to run all contexts on a specific pull request. I also wanted to point out the ref spec here. Um, GitHub provides its own remote uh, ref spec for pull requests. Um, if you're working locally and you just do a git pool, you might not actually get these, um, depending on your configuration. So I, I just wanted to kind of uh, include a slide on that. You can also see further below that there's a specific environment variable, the GHPRB actual commit. Um, so the GitHub pull request builder uh, contains some custom environment variables that are specific to the plugin. So we use those in our job configuration. 
In this case, we wanna be 100% sure that we're using the actual commit that was submitted. So if someone uh, pushes uh, an amended commit or pushes a new commit, um, uh, that won't interfere. Or at least it won't, won't give uh, false, false positives or false negatives. Just a couple more highlights. We can whitelist branches. So in our case, um, I gave you six, um, six example jobs. We actually have some uh, LTS branches that we use for the open source community. So uh, instead of just six jobs, we'll have more than that so that we can support um, building on these particular branches. This plugin also includes a whitelist for contributors. Um, it's very easy to configure. I don't have a screenshot for you, but um, it can also operate by GitHub organization. Um, we found it to be very useful. If you are running your infrastructure and you're concerned about um, uh, just letting any contributor run whatever they want, um, you can use the whitelist uh, facility in this plugin to protect you a little bit. I did want to call it a couple gotchas. So um, we're, we're following best practice actually with this plugin by using a bot user. We have a GitHub bot user that manages the uh, communication with Jenkins. Um, but we've locked down that particular bot user with uh, API token permissioning on GitHub. If you were to all go in and use this plugin and build six jobs uh, and just take it as it is, uh, your first pull, pull request would have six responses that were identical saying, can you please verify? Um, that's something that we sort of overrode by um, removing those comments. It's, it's very straightforward, but I just wanted to call it out. Uh, I wanted to take a quick sidebar just to highlight a few other plugins that we use because I think that's useful. In our case, I mentioned we're a Python shop. A lot of Python unit testing tools can actually uh, give you unit testing results in an X unit style XML file. Those can easily be parsed by the X unit and J unit plugins, so we use that. Uh, here, we'll, uh, we'll highlight all the various things here. Similar, uh, we find coverage to be important. When I mentioned six jobs, um, and you multiply that by the number of branches we have. We also, because we're open source, um, for security kinds of patches, we need a private copy as well. So you can see it's quickly multiplying into, you know, 30, 40 jobs. Um, that's very easy for us to manage with the job DSL plugin. So we've essentially codified our jobs, um, uh, and it's very easy to make one change. For example, if the bok choy context needs a change, we don't have to do it in you know, eight different places. We can just do it once and uh, rerun the job DSL. Uh, we use the build flow plugin, just calling that out as deprecated uh, in the monitoring. We've also chosen to um, wrap our Jenkins infrastructure with uh, a couple of additional um, tools, such as New Relic, Splunk, Datadog. I wanted to specifically highlight Splunk for you. Um, because in, under the concept of um, dividing into different contexts, into the six different units of feedback, um, Splunk, um, Splunk becomes more useful and more interesting. Um, so I wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about that. If you don't know Splunk, it's a log aggregator. Right, so it's a big data tool. Uh, in our case, we aggregate all the log data of all these various jobs. Um, for what it's worth, we also aggregate the console log on Jenkins Master. It's true we were able to do some level of analysis on jobs before we um, separated into six different contexts. But um, as an engineer or as a contributor that's trying to do the analysis, it's much more straightforward to already have uh, the data divided into separate, separate buckets, essentially, uh, for analysis. Um, and that really opened up avenues for us for Splunk um, in terms of doing our analysis. Here's an example. This actually isn't the six jobs. This includes all the uh, sub jobs associated with it. But we are able to easily determine where to make optimizations, for example. In the previous world, when we had one big build that took an hour, it was a lot harder to determine what's taking up all the time. There's gonna be additional analysis uh, to dig into which system, uh, when, which particular kind of uh, test runner was costly. By using Splunk and by dividing it into separate contexts, it becomes much easier. Here we're able to see that some of the bok choy, 
bok choy shards, we call them shards, um, are the things that we'd want to optimize first if we decided to speed up the uh, build process. The flaky test problem also becomes a lot more straightforward. Since we're able to break it up into separate contexts and run an analysis on our aggregated logs, um, what previously felt like a, a game of roulette um, becomes one that's, that's backed with metrics and data. So we can easily prioritize, for example, this test, um, the uh, <laughs> test course grade factory um, test is obviously gonna be the first thing that we want to uh, fix as a flaky test. And we'll just give you a couple slides of um, additional great stuff we get out of using a log aggregator. So in our case, we uh, measure and keep the history on queue lengths. We just use the uh, Jenkins REST uh, API. We also use the EC2 plugin. We're all in the cloud. I mentioned earlier that we can scale up to 200 nodes. Um, there are multiple plugins that um, can help manage the infrastructure. We use this one. And you can see that there are periods of action and periods of quiet that generally correspond with, you know, when engineers are doing their work. Um, in our case, uh, if we can get up to 200 uh, nodes, uh, when you consider the cost per hour of each node, or, or, or rather of a set of 200 nodes, um, being able to scale up and scale down can literally save us tens of thousands of dollars. So it's a really, it's an awesome plugin. I just wanted to mention that. Um, the main point, though, is uh, using a log aggregator makes that uh, a lot easier to tell that story, um, uh, to understand the value of that plugin and to understand our usage of the infrastructure. Uh, th that's essentially it. Um, I'll just highlight for you essentially what I wanted to talk about. Again, we aggressively use this plugin. It speeds up development, it speeds up code review. Uh, we use fewer cycles on our infrastructure and um, just moving out of the one bit kind of um, view of the CI system has been a, 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 real, um, a real boon for us. So that's it. That's all I got. I'll be sticking around if anyone has questions, but thanks a lot for coming.